welcome to Socrates in the City, Oxford edition. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Please, please. Please remain in your seats. Remain in your seats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th this really is uh, tremendous uh, to be here. I've thought about this for the longest time, uh, wanting to, to come and do this uh, in Oxford. It seems to me that half of the speakers that I've wanted to have as my guests are all here or near here, and I thought, wouldn't it be cost-effective and wonderful uh, not to have to pay for business fare, airfare, to fly them over to New York, for example? Because <laughs> they're all prima donnas, especially, um, what's his name, the man? Uh, but no, it really is, it's so funny, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to do a whole bunch of them right here in Oxford, please? Uh, and, um, and so we've done it, uh, we've done it, but we're, we're just excited. Socrates in the City, in case you don't know anything about it, uh, is uh, called Socrates in the City because Socrates famously said the unexamined life is not worth living, and then he blew his brains out in an alley. You probably didn't, yeah, that was a joke. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have guns in antiquity. Uh, no, Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living, and so we thought, that's true, and especially in New York, people lead rather unexamined lives. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a speaker series where I interview people and we talk about the big things that people typically don't talk about, certainly not in polite society, uh, God, the meaning of life, does life have meaning, all those things that, you know, get you thrown out of those parties, won't get you thrown out of Socrates City. In fact, just the bigger the better. We like the big questions. So, um, we have a smorgasbord of speakers here at Oxford and back in the States, uh, and we, we have fun. The idea is to have fun. The, the, the search for truth and meaning ought to be fun, it seems to me. So, uh, so that's what we do. We've been doing it for a number of years, and you can go, obviously, SocratesInTheCity.com, number of um, YouTube videos and interviews, and sometimes just speakers. We used to do it just where the speakers would, would speak, but then I couldn't interrupt them, and it was inconvenient <laughs> for me. Uh, so my uh, guest today, he looks poised to leap up here, so I better get on with it. Uh, is very difficult to describe. Uh, he's described himself alternatively as an evangelist, minister, speaker, social activist, and writer, and that doesn't even begin to do it. Uh, he uh, has spoken at conferences and universities in 69 countries. Imagine he counted them. How, how pathetic is that? And not 68, no, now it's 69, and I'm gonna put that in the bio. And on six continents, sadly, there are seven continents. It's so sad that he wasn't able to make it to Antarctica, as if the people there don't need God. Um, I joke only because my guest is kind of a big deal. Many of you are, are uh, just in a tizzy that, that you're in the same room as Canon J. John. I've gotten over it. Um, <laughs> He has written, but he is, a, he is a big deal, and if you've heard him speak, he speaks to zillions of people uh, every year. He's written over 50 books, a few of them um, himself, and because when you get to that level, you have, you have staff. Uh, even your ghostwriters have staff. You don't, you don't even read the books. You don't even read the books, but who cares? Uh, there are a million copies of his books in print in 13 languages, and I've had this issue too. It's a wonderful thing to have your books translated into other languages. The difficulty always is to eventually see if you can get them translated back into English <laughs> so that your friends can read them. Really. No, really. Uh, J. John, uh, we can ask him about his name in a moment, is a Greek Cypriot by birth. Now, this is perhaps the most exciting part of this for me personally, and I want to ask him about that because I have a Greek background as well. Um, he lives in Trolleywood, Hertfordshire, 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 what is it? In Hereford, Hartford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly happen. <laughs> yes? The rain in Spain. He, uh, he lives in Hertfordshire, is this correct? Hertfordshire, thank you, thank you. And he's married to Killy, uh, who, who is here. If you're married to somebody named Killy, we know you're not from Texas. We don't have Killies over, over by us. That's a very uh, English name. Uh, his goal in life is really to help people discover spiritual meaning in a way that makes sense of everyday life, which is why I like this man very much. A warm Oxford Socrates in the city welcome, please, for Canon J. John. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Here he is. Thank you. Please remain seated. You. Please, please. <laughs> remain seated. Wow. Well, here we are. Here we are, Eric. How are you? I'm, I'm in good heart. How are you? I like your, your, your accent so much that I'm tempted to imitate you. Are you? 
give it a go. No. No. I can't do it. Later. Just, just even the way you say, are you? Are you? See, I wouldn't say, I'd say, are you? Are you? I'd say, are you? And you'd say, are you? You. Yeah. Like there's a sort of an edge. Yes. Which is why you're so entertaining to listen to. It's, it's very warm and appealing. I wouldn't go that far. No, okay. Uh, but it, it is. It's extremely warm and appealing. We met in New York City uh, what, in April, I guess it yes. was. We finally got together. We have a number of friends in common. We do. And they insisted we get together. Yes. And that's even before they realized that you're Greek and I'm Greek and that yes. that's the main point of contact as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Okay, so if you don't mind, well, we're gonna speak uh, for the, at least for the first 20 minutes in Greek. in Greek. So just, if you need to have a cigarette break, this would be a great time to do it. Um, <laughs> Okay. 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 Uh, and having followed you somewhat uh, and looked at your work, I realize it is difficult to, to pin you down, which um, I would say is a compliment because I think that part of the problem we have in the culture today, when we're talking about faith issues or talking about larger issues, the issues of life, people get uncomfortable and they feel comfortable if they can pigeonhole you and say, ah, he's one of those, thank you very much. But when you defy those categories, or you defy easy categorization, it actually forces people to pay a little bit of attention to figure out what it is that you're saying, which is good, because then they actually have to hear what it is you're saying. So let's start there. How do you describe yourself? What is it that you do? Well, I say different things to different people. OK, pretend you're talking to me. OK. <laughs> So, well, if I, I'll give you an analogy. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport in London. Mm -hmm. And I said, hello. And she said, oh, hello. And I said, uh, where That's are you? That's a very good imitation of that woman, by the That's way. That's it. That was so I cool. said, where are you going? And she said, Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? So I said, Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. And then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals, we've got homeless shelters, we've got hostels, hospices, we do marriage work, justice work, we've got orphanages, we've got feeding programs. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death and we deal in the area of behavioral alteration. And she went, wow! But I mean, like, really loud. People all turned around and looked at us. And she says, what's it called? I said, it's called the church. Have you heard of it? <laughs> you know, it's a straight she... away. It kind of, it moved the goalposts. I love to know what her reaction was. Did she feel that you were putting her on? No. But we, we, well, we spoke from London to Singapore <laughs> about the church. What does it do? Why does From it do London it? From London to Singapore, that's uh, a couple of hours. It's a bit longer, actually. Huh? Yeah, and I was a little bit annoyed because I wanted to watch movies. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. But I, when... I think what happened, you know, it kind of picked up. There was a curiosity that was created, and it was like, wow. And, and actually, one of the things I try to do, Eric, is, is, is also give people a kind of a different perspective on things. Uh, to see things in a different way. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. That's part of the issue, and I want to talk to you about that as well, that l we, we live in a culture in the West, uh, specifically here uh, in England, and certainly where I'm from, New York in the States, where when you talk about God stuff, anything yes. related to it, people don't know how to have that. They either don't speak that language, so it makes them uncomfortable, or they've had some bad experience with some freakish... Uh, I would say, heretical branch of the faith, and, which they mistake for the faith because it was presented as such. And so they're very uncomfortable. And so to be able to give people a different perspective seems to me the first step in actually communicating anything. Yeah. Well, a, lo a lot of people's understanding of Christianity is actually a misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, 
engaging in such a way as to clear away those misunderstandings. Yeah. That's the first task of any kind of engagement with people. Well, it's funny because uh, if you think of it, and I know you do, that was exactly what Jesus does in the Gospels. Yes. Or did, does. Uh, it, 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 because he was most attacked, of course, by the religious figures of the day who themselves had this misunderstanding and who had communicated this misunderstanding to the people so that he must have been initially confusing. But what I, yes, but what I like, I, I like the encounter with Jesus and a, a, a woman known as the Samaritan woman. Now, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman, there were big barriers between these two people. I mean, Jesus was the high, high priest and she yeah. was living in adultery. Okay, men didn't, sp so you've got a moral barrier. This then, woman at the well. Woman at the well. The famous woman at the well. She, she got a moral yeah. barrier there. Yeah. Then men didn't speak, women didn't speak to men that right. they didn't know. You've got a social barrier. Then he's Jewish, she's Samaritan, so you've got a racial barrier. Jesus was Jewish? Yes, he was. And then Jesus being Jewish, there was a religious barrier because she was a Samaritan. So you've got a moral barrier, social barrier, racial barrier, religious barrier. And how did Jesus speak to this woman? Well, he spoke to her on the one thing they had in common, which was H2O, water. People don't often see that, that in fact, Jesus engages with whatever we've got in common. I have never, I mean, I've heard many sermons on that passage, but I've never heard that ever. The idea that he engages her on the one thing that they have in yeah, common. He doesn't focus on what they don't have in common. It's, well, it's interesting too, because I think that part of the problem that, I, I've seen this many times where people are trying to communicate their faith, they're excited about their faith, but as they communicate, they do it in what I would call a religious way, which is initially off-putting, because yeah. people say, I don't speak that language. Yes. But the idea that J Jesus himself yes. <laughs> does not do that, that he engages her on the level of, of water, yeah, and what's uh, interesting, if you look at that story, which is uh, recorded in, in the New Testament of the Bible in John chapter 4, what's interesting is she addresses him on four occasions, okay? The first time she addresses him, she says, Jew, okay? But if you read it in its context, it's a bit like this, <laughs> Jew, that's the first time she addresses him. She says, him. you being a Jew? Yeah, but it's pretty rough. Yeah. Right? The second time she addresses him, she says, sir. The third time she addresses him, she says, prophet. The fourth time she addresses him, she says, Messiah. So in this conversation, her entire perspective changed. That's yes. what we're about. Yeah. We're trying to help people see things differently so that they can gain this new perspective. Well, I mean, this gets to the issue of, uh, again, in the US and here, people often, we, we've gotten to a point in the culture where uh, the idea of sharing one's faith is publicly scorned, and people say, well, I don't mind if you believe this, but don't proselytize. They love the word proselytize, don't even know what it means most people, but they use it in that negative context to say, just don't start with me. And I think to myself, it's such a bizarre thing because if you feel that you have discovered something wonderful, yes. you really can't shut up about it. So the question is, how does one not shut up about it in a way that's not off-putting? Uh, I mean, you've basically told us, but I guess my question is, can that be learned or is that innate? Because I know there's some people that are very natural, you seem to be very naturally gifted at talking about the big questions. Uh, but there are other people that feel, maybe they feel theologically forced to do it. They think, well, I yeah. must share my faith, um, and it comes across forced. But is it something that can be learned? People ask the same question about writing or public speaking. Can it be learned, or is it simply innate? No, I think, I think we can learn it. I mean, there's two things. One, we're talking about content, and then two, we're talking about communication. So we've got to get the content right, but we also got to get the communication right. And sometimes, uh, you know, Christians should be the way, but we do get in the way. Mm. Sometimes the manner in which we convey things uh, are not helpful, but they become hindrances. Mm. And, and I think we really do need to work at conveying it clearly, 
concisely. Excuse me, my chicken's ready. I'll be right back. I think so. <laughs> I have a. I, this is one yeah. of my favorite parts about Oxy. Those of you who live here yeah. don't understand how wonderful this is to those of us who live in New York, <laughs> where we don't have bells. Yes. They've been outlawed by our communist mayor. Were you aware of that? Mm. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't. No. Yeah. Anyway. Oh yeah. But that he's we a communist. Love them. Yeah. He. No. It's just it's so beautiful. Yeah. So it beautiful. is, isn't it? But not during a TV taping. No. Please. Um, when you talk about uh, what you're talking about now, it seems to me that part, I mean, even though part of this can be learned, nonetheless, there are people who bring a freshness to it, um, and it's, it's noticeable. People have said that about me at times. When I met you, immediately I, I said, this is a person who knows how to communicate these things in a way that feels fun or feels natural, and, and obviously that's something that's very important to me. But in getting to know you, it struck me that part of the reason is because of your story, which in some ways is similar to mine. I flipped out, yes. as you remember, yes. when I found out that you weren't just sort of Greek, but you were actually Greek from a home yes. with a real Greek mother and a real Greek father, and Absolutely. you spoke Greek at home, and you knew that world of sheer lunacy as I, better than I know it. Yes. And I say that, of course, with tremendous affection. But to meet someone, because a lot of times in yeah. America, I'll meet somebody with a Greek name, like my wife. Yes. And people say to you, oh, Metaxas, do you speak Greek? She, no, my, yeah. she doesn't speak Greek. My daughter who's here, do you speak Greek? No. In other words, there are people with Greek surnames, but maybe they're grandparents or something. Sure. So to meet you and to realize, yes. you know, you're of this ilk. I am. What's the Aramaic for ilk? <laughs> there is no word. But you're of that ilk, and I, so I, w I was hoping maybe you'd tell your story. Sure. You shared it with me, but yes. I, I think it's a window into a lot of what we're talking about. Well, you know when the movie uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding came out? Yes. Yeah, have you seen that movie, some of you? Yeah? And uh, friends of mine said to me, oh, is that what Greek culture's like? Yeah. I said, no. No. It's worse. Yeah. <laughs> and um, th th there is great, there is power in culture, mm -hmm. and there is, there's an upside to culture, there's a downside to culture. Uh, there's, there's, there's great heritage in culture, but there are great hindrances in culture. And um, uh, I was born and brought up in a, in a Greek Cypriot home. Right. Uh, we ended up living in, I lived in Cyprus as a child, then we lived in uh, London. Now, what's interesting is, is that cultures that came from around the world to London tried to retain the culture yeah. that they once left, yeah. but the culture back home has progressed. Right, you know, exactly. So in fact, the Greeks in London yeah. are more Greek right. than the Greeks back home. Well, that's, exa that's exactly the way it is in the States, yeah. that Greeks in America, their religion and their hobby is being Greek. Yeah. What's your hobby? I'm Greek. I'm Greek. Like being Greek, cultivating yeah, 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 yeah. my Greekness. It's all Greek. Now that wasn't the case with me because my mother no. was German, so I felt like an outcast, like Absolutely. a half breed, like a Samaritan, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and but for you, you were in the middle of this. Oh yeah. I mean, like you know, my my uncle. We. I mean, every Sunday, all the uncles, all the aunties, all the cousins, everyone together. It's like every Sunday. And you know, my, my uncle would say, oh, John, what are you gonna be when you grow up? And my mother would reply, he's gonna be a doctor. It's like, well, consult me first. You know, it, it's like there's this culture yeah. of you've got to achieve, you've yeah. got to be the best, yeah. you've got to progress. My parents ran a restaurant. And when I was um, 11 years of age, uh, after school on a Friday, my brother and I would have to catch the train go to the restaurant, and I'd have to work in the restaurant from, I'd, we'd arrive about 4.30, work till midnight. Next day, we would uh, have to go back to the restaurant, 9 a.m., work till midnight on, yeah? Sunday, I'd have a Greek tutor to study Greek and pass all my exams in Greek. Get to and then, Yeah, and then after the Greek lessons, all the family would come. It's like, yeah, and I remember saying to my dad, I said, to you, Dad, you, you don't pay me to, to, to work in the restaurant on Friday. Pay you? Pay you? I give you a house. You have a bedroom. You have food. You want pay? Are you not ashamed of yourself? No. Give me some money. Yeah. 
it wasn't the Greek thing to do to give your kids some money. No. Because it was like, I've done all this for you. Well, as far as that goes, I'm very Greek. <laughs> uh, where's my daughter? Has she already slunk out? Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, now, you, you have to tell the story, to, because to grow up in that culture, yeah. people don't realize, when people often say that if somebody grows up in a Jewish culture, the idea of becoming a Christian is anathema. The yeah. family is, is scandalized. If you grow up in a Muslim culture, it's uh, worse than anathema. Yes. But similarly, people wouldn't realize that if you grow up in a Greek which is to say Greek Orthodox culture. Yes. If you have some kind of encounter, as I did and you did, and you become a instant Jesus freak, yes. especially when you're young and you're outspoken, and, and uh, it's as if you've joined an ashram or uh, a, a cult, yes. or, or you have said, I hate you to your Greek family, uh, they really are disturbed by it. Now, That's I experienced hugely. that only to some extent because only my yeah. father is, is Greek. But you uh, really went through it. So can you tell that, yeah. that story? And again, it's culture. So basically, um, I was a teenager. And that was my point. That was my, yeah. I just want to it's underscore that. Culture. My point was that it's the culture. It's it really culture. doesn't have so much to do with religion. So when people no. talk about Jews or Muslims, they think it's about the religion. In fact, yeah. it's much more about no. the yeah. culture. They feel that you have Absolutely. turned your back on them and everything that they've given you in the culture. Yeah, so to be Greek means you're Greek Orthodox. Right. Okay. So it's a little bit like you're Jewish, but you're an atheist, yeah. but you're still Jewish. Right, Do that's you see? it. So that's you're, right. it's like you cannot be Greek and not be Greek Orthodox. Right. So I was at agnostic as a teenager, and that was fine because I was still Greek right. Orthodox, right. you see. And uh, so I then go to college in London. And I meet a Greek Christian, okay? I'd never met a Greek of someone who was who a practicing Christian, right. but he was also Greek. And over a period of time, I came to understand what it was all about. Um, I said at my baptism that my friend Andy Economides built a bridge from him to me. And when he did, Christ Jesus walked over it. And and it was like that. And when, when I decided to become a follower of Jesus, the light came on. And my mother said to me, you're brainwashed. I said, Your mom, mother said My that mother to said to me, you're brainwashed. I said, mum, my brain has been washed. If you only knew, mum, what was in my brain, you'd be pleased it got washed. <laughs> the thing is, my brain did get washed. And, but I started to see things differently. And you, so you had a, a, a bona fide conversion experience, which is yeah. very rare. I mean, on it's, the it's, 9th it's, of February, 1975, at 10 p.m. That's what, for me. You know, but some people say, oh, I don't, I don't have a date. I don't, oh, and they're a bit kind of concerned that I don't have a date. Oh, don't worry about that. I mean, I can't remember the day I was born, but I was, you know. <laughs> Why? Because there seems to be evidence to suggest right, it. Right, you know, right, right. so you don't have to worry about the right. date. Okay, but I did have a date. But this was the thing, Eric. The, the 10th of February, I'm walking to college. And I, from where I lived to where I went to college was about... Uh, anyway, it took me about 30 minutes to walk. And I'm walking, and I see a homeless man. And, all, and I stop, and I say to him, hey, have you had breakfast? He said, no. I said, do you want breakfast? He said, yes. So I said, well, I'll take you for breakfast. So I took him for breakfast. I said, where do you hang out? He says, you know where you met me? That's where I hang out. I said, no, no, no. Normally, where do you hang out? He goes, you know where you met me? That's where I hang out. He says, that's where I start in the mornings, and then I go to the library in the afternoons. And I thought, if he's telling me the truth, Monday to Friday, throughout September, October, November, December, and January, I walked past him, and I never saw him. This is the first day I'm now a follower of Jesus, and I'm seeing homeless people. I thought, what's happening to me? And I started to think, goodness, I've never... I've never ever stopped for a homeless man. And then I said to him, listen, look, I can't do this every day, but I said, would you like breakfast once a week? Yeah. So, he, and he said, can I bring my friends? And I'm like, goodness, I didn't think homeless people had friends. And um, so he would bring four friends and we started Wednesday homeless club breakfast. I approve. I know. Um, 
but it's, it's funny because people say things like this. My wife has said this. I've had a number of friends say this, that if you have a particularly dramatic conversion, in fact, you can see things differently. Suddenly yeah. something strange happens. Yeah. It didn't quite happen to me that way, but, but I've heard a number of stories like this, that yeah. it really is... Uh, it's bizarre, and you, you remember it for the rest of your life because you it's such a, you cross the line. Well, I surprised myself. Yeah. I like, I, later on, I think, I've never had breakfast with a homeless man before. Why did I do that? Yeah. And why have I just said I'm going to take him for breakfast once a week? And then all of a sudden, I, 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 my vocabulary cleaned up. Goodness, how did that happen? And all of a sudden, I, I'm being more kind, and I'm being more loving, and I'm being more generous, and I'm being... And I started to surprise myself. Yeah. Yeah, as I was saying, people don't really believe that that happens. But yeah. I know that you're not making it up. I know that to some extent it happened to me. And many people I've spoken yeah. with have described this, that yes. it's just, it's startling and it can happen that people can, can become dramatically different. So now, how old were you at this point? 18. 18. All right. It seems to me that your family would not have liked this. I mean, you no. said a little bit about that. No. But what was their response? Were you, were you typically in the Greek church Every Sunday doesn't sound like it. No, but but we went obviously Easter, Christmas, all right. those and other right. occasions, right. special occasions mm -hmm. like that. Um, but you know, I I then started reading the Bible. I started, I mean, I I would eat eat a book a night. I could eat one. I could. It doesn't matter what time I went to bed. I'd start reading a book and I'd read the whole book. I one a night. I couldn't get enough of it. I was reading Christian biographies. I was reading the Bible. I, I couldn't get enough of it. I just couldn't get enough of it. So your parents think you've gone crazy. Yeah, it was like he's reading the Bible all the time. He's reading all these books all the time. And then um, I, I started, uh, the church said to me, well, Andy Conomides took me to church and, um, and then said to me about going to Bible study on a Wednesday night and then going to church and going to this. And I thought, oh, OK, all right. So then I was doing that several nights a week. So obviously my parents are like, what, what, what's he joined? What, what's, what, what's he doing? And, right. and all of this. And so there started to be quite a bit of friction that escalated mm -hmm. to the point where um, I had to leave home. Really? Yes. When did that happen? I got home, and my mother had burnt my Bible and all my books. Intentionally? Well, everything. Yeah. The lot. Yeah, that, for example, that was a joke. That was, <laughs> you got I, that. I didn't actually not know. No, uh, no. But, but the lot. I mean, wait a minute, but wait a minute. This, this is very, it's funny and horrific. Yes. Your mother burnt everything. Burnt, now, everything. It's one thing to throw them in the garbage. Yeah. She burnt. Burnt them. She burnt them. Can I ask all of how them. she burnt them? She how do you burn books in the dustbin? You know, what? Yeah, she, she burnt the burnt lot. them. Burnt the yeah, lot. Okay. All my books. All my. I mean, I, mean, I had loads. I just, I, you know, like I said, I, I would read one a night. Now, what, what do you think drove her to this? Because that's it's very dramatic. Well, but obviously. the thing is, I think Greeks are very. Uh, there's a lot of drama. It, there is a lot of drama. Really? Yes. It's very loud, it's very kind of expressive, uh, and they go to extremes. Yeah. You know, and there's the shock treatment yeah. sort of thing. And, um, yes. you know, but the thing <laughs> is, you know, I was becoming a nicer person. What, what happened to your parents? When you tell a story like yours and there's such difficulty, you, you, you clearly, uh, you said, you. You ran away from home. You had to leave. Yes. I had something similar happen. Doesn't sound yes. like it was as dramatic. No one burned anything. Maybe yes. I got out just in time. They might have. But uh, I burned all my Super Tramp and Kansas albums. Just uh, to be clear. And if you're Christian, you need to do that. I. Uh, yeah. I broke. I broke a lot of my records. Really? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's the devil's music. So, um, but but seriously, what? You know, so many years have passed since that time. What did happen to your parents? Did they soften up about your newfound faith? Well, I didn't see them for a number of years. Oh. And then I uh, met Killy. We got engaged. So I thought, ah, oh, here's an opportunity to build bridges, new beginnings. So I rang up my parents and said, having not spoken to them for years. How many years? Probably... Uh, 
I may have spoken to them once or twice very, very briefly, but really, I don't think I'd had a, a, a good conversation with them for five years. That's very dramatic. Was yeah. that, that must have been very painful. Oh, it was painful. But then I ring up and I say, look, I'm engaged. Do you want to meet your future daughter-in-law? And they said, no. <laughs> so I said, oh, come on. So I take her down. Did they know she wasn't Greek? I said, I said. And then we went down and they were hostile and they refused to come to the wedding. So that was painful, <sighs> very painful. Wow. Then we had a son. So we thought, ah, it's going to be different. But, but let me just ask you before you say that, when you say they refused to come to the wedding, was it because of the faith thing or was it because, and I'm not kidding, that your, your, your wife is not Greek? Is that because Both. it feels like the same kind of thing? Yes. It's related that you've betrayed yes. us, you've turned your back on everything Correct. we wanted for you. Yes. And you're not a doctor. Yes, that's right. You're not a doctor. Uh, you're, you're doing this work, which we don't approve. And you're marrying an English girl. What could be worse than what that? What could be worse than that? <laughs> anyway, but you know, uh, one of the things, Eric, I, I've been teaching, um, in fact, since the year 2000, I've been teaching a series on the Ten Commandments. And one of the Ten Commandments is honor your mother and father. And I've really had to grapple with that one. Yeah. What does it actually mean? And, and I think that commandment can mean different things to different people, yeah. okay? But I think to me, uh, there's a verse in the Bible, in the book of Romans, uh, which says this, as much as it lies within you, keep the peace. In other words, don't worry about their reaction. As much as it lies within me, irrespective of how they treat me, how they, re you know, I, re I respond in a particular way. So in a court of law, you address the judge as your honor. That's got nothing to do with his personality. You are honoring his position. Yes. And so I thought, right, I'm gonna honor them. And, and I, I decided I, I will ring them. I will keep the door open. I will, and now, even though my mom, mother doesn't understand what I do, well, she didn't think I'd do anything, actually, but, you know, um, I ring her once a week. And I'm amazed, Eric, that some people speak to their parents once a year. And I'm going, well, where do they live? You know, do they live in New Zealand? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, my mother lives in Cyprus, and I phone her once a week. And I'm thinking, well, that's the least that I can do. Yeah. And it's like saying, well, what's the, what can I do? Because there's no point buying a nice coffin, coffin and getting nice flowers when she dies. Mm. It's too late. Well, that, th this is a big one for me. Uh, honor your mother and your father because it ties into what you were saying about the idea of it. It's about the position. Yeah. It, your father and mother don't have to be a good mother and father. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You're commanded by God to honor them. Yes. It's the same way you're commanded to, to pray for your leaders. Absolutely. Uh, if your leader is Hitler, you're commanded to pray for him. Doesn't yeah. mean you're commanded to like him. Yeah. You're not even commanded to like your parents, but you're commanded to honor them. It's yes. an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Um, the office is what God's talking about. Yes. It's like, he's your father. Yeah. Therefore, I command you to honor him. And interesting that the commandment says, it's actually good for you. Yeah. It's the only command yeah. where it actually says, if you do this, yeah. it's healthy for you. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much hostility within us. Mm. And if we could only let go of that hostility, that unforgiveness, because mm. um, if we can't forgive, we break the bridge yeah. on which we must cross. I've been thinking about that particularly with some family issues recently, so it's good to hear you. Yeah. Uh, reiterate what what you're saying because it really can be um, a terrible burden to carry around unforgiveness yes. terrible burden yeah. a crippling a crippling burden there are people who are crippled by unforgiveness and maybe they have never heard someone say to them yeah. God commands you to forgive if God commands us to do something it's easier to do it yeah. because you don't even have to think about it you just go well I must even though I don't want to I must, and you do it and things happen. Absolutely. 
Uh, you had said something about bringing your, um, when, you, when you had a child born, you went to see your parents. I don't want to cut you off on no, that. No, but saying. yeah, I, we thought, okay, that will be different. You know, grandchild, and it no. wasn't. Wow. Anyway, and that, that particular son, grandchild, is, um, he actually got ordained two weeks ago. Wow. And <laughs> <laughs> so he's 28. And Did you name him Yanakis or something? Michael. Michael. And so he's now a minister. So, wow. you know, we, I mean, another generation yeah. of, is following Jesus. Right. Irrespective of what's happened along the journey. Right. Tremendous. Wow. I ended up going to theological college, uh, a seminary, uh, and I studied theology. And then I went to work in Northern Ireland, and I was working in reconciliation uh, and healing. And I worked in a prison in Belfast, uh, and I did that for a while. And then, in a prison in Belfast? Yes, during the Troubles. During the Troubles? Yes. What, how did you end up doing that? Well, because uh, I was part of a community that worked in reconciliation. Now, by the way, an American audience won't know, many of them won't know what you mean by during the Troubles. Okay, there, there were some serious troubles, uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland and uh, Britain, yeah. and major conflicts. Yeah, violence. Violence, and bombings, death, bombings, the bombings, whole lot. And, and, we and, and over go, here you refer yeah. to it as the Troubles. And every month... So in we, the midst of that in the midst, hell, I was there. you were in Belfast, yes. of all places, yes. but in a prison. Well, in fact, I was, I was in a place called Ross Trevor, yeah. which was on the border, not far from where I lived. Yeah. Was, uh, loads of soldiers got blown up. And we used to go and take the services in Crumlin Road Prison, which was the maximum security prison where most of these people were. And it's that in kind of environment. You see, you're, you're, you're trying... Do you believe that, that God can make a difference to these people? Well, if you do, how, how's he going to make a difference? So even as a young Christian, I'm grappling with these issues. So did that. Then I went and worked for a church uh, in the north of England, Robin Nottingham, where Robin Hood's from. And I worked there, and then I started getting invitations to go and speak at universities. That's how it started. I didn't, and then I did one university, I did two, I did three, and I ended up doing 102 around the world. 102 universities? I, I did 102 university missions, college missions. Wow. And, and it was that where you're engaging with students yeah. and, and trying to answer questions and trying to convey in a convincing manner mm. what it's all about. And then I did that, then I did towns, and then I did cities, and, and then it just, it's not that I chose, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna right. do that. One thing led on to well, another. But it, it, it brings up sort of a, a theme uh, of mine, this idea that when you're forced to communicate anything, not just things of the faith, but when you're forced to communicate with kind of a strange group, it forces you to find new language. Yes. It, it's almost like if you know about uh, you know, the uh, circulation system that, that when you're exercising, your, you, your, 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 your blood has to find new passages and sure. creates capillaries and gives you more uh, abilities to, um, to flow. And it's the same thing with if you're forced, or you could say the same thing about being forced to write a sonnet. It forces yes. you to be creative within the strictures of the sonnet. Yes. And when you're talking to people, uh, whether it's children or people uh, in an asylum or, uh, or in a prison, in a funny way, you can't rely on the old bromides and the no, cliches. No. You, you're, you're forced to, and they're coming to take you away. Do you hear this? Yes. The, I... um, but, you're for, but it's so interesting because that to me is the difference between what I call dead religion and real faith. Real yes. faith must be communicated in a fresh way way. Yes. And by speaking to groups where you cannot, or to, or to people where you cannot rely on those well-worn tracks, yes. so to speak, you, you cannot go there. You have to find fresh ways. And somehow, only then are you actually able to communicate, because otherwise yes. people can hear it and not hear it, so to speak. I, I agree. But sometimes I think, Harry, you know, you can argue, and it, it's stalemate. And you can't, yeah. you're not going to win this. Yeah. Uh, 
on my last trip back from Singapore, the, the flight was midnight, left midnight from Singapore. Uh, get on the plane, and um, so you've got to wait until it kind of goes up before you can go to sleep, really. So I've been on planes before. You've been on planes yeah. before. Right, I'm, so I'm just giving you the, kind of the detail. <laughs> so, and, um, so I, I then uh, think, right, okay, I'm going to go to the restroom, yeah. and then I'm going to go to sleep. Yeah. So I go to the restroom, and uh, one of the stewards says to me, oh, hello, and uh, as I'm waiting to go into the restroom, he said, um, uh, holiday in Singapore, work? I said, oh, I'll work, I said. And uh, he said, oh, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a, I, I'm a motivational speaker for behavioral alteration. Remember, this is 1 a.m. now. I, it's just short, let's cut it short. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, whoa, hey, I have to speak to you. Oh, I have to speak no, to you. Don't. And I'm like, I need to get to sleep. I need to get to sleep. Anyway, I, I go to the restroom. I come out. He says, we've got to talk. It turns out he's the purser, right? The, the chief guy in charge of, you know, the pilot's in charge of the plane, but he's the oh, chief on the purser. Plane. On the plane. He's the purser, he's not the, purser. the bursar. No, purser. The purser. <laughs> so then he starts asking me questions. And uh, he, uh, so I said to him, listen, well, you know, I said, do you believe in God? He goes, no, I'm a free thinker. I said, listen, there's nothing free about your thinking. And um, so that, and then. Except they got to laugh then. Yeah, 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 yeah. But listen, so then I'm getting so tired, I thought, oh, I haven't got, I had, uh, I'm not going to argue with you. So I said, listen, can I, can I say a prayer for you? And uh, nobody had ever prayed for him in his life. Okay. So I put my hand on his chest and I pray a simple put prayer. Put your hand on his chest? Yes, yes, like this. Did he have a cough? <laughs> Well, he didn't actually. No. And then, and then I prayed a prayer. He was so overwhelmed by the presence of something, it totally blew him away. Okay? But I'm tired. So I said, listen, I'm going to go to sleep. I'll talk to you later. Okay? I go to sleep, wake up four hours later. He's standing waiting, he says, Mr. John, we must talk. He said, what was that? I said, well, that was the presence of God. He said, I want that. I honestly, I can tell you stories like that all over the world. I've argued with people and it's stalemate. But when they've encountered the yeah. presence of God, They've understood. That's the conundrum, because I think that in my case, I, uh, I needed a fair amount of talking to get me ready to experience God. Sure. Uh, and, and I think that's the, the, the key to, to my mind, is that when you're communicating on such big issues, everyone is different. Everybody has, brings of different course. baggage, of course. different uh, preconceived notions, uh, different woundedness, different questions. Uh, in my case, I needed someone to make me feel like this is p perhaps plausible before I would sort of open myself up to it. Sure. Many people, of course, are not that way. They're not that way. But for me, it was like the brush needed to be cleared away for me to be able to see across, you know, uh, yeah. to what I was looking at. But you're, you're right. There are other people that the moment they... I had a miraculous experience happen to me uh, a, a number of times, but not so many. I, I don't, it doesn't happen to me as often as to you. Not that you're a better person, because I know you and you're not. But <laughs> I do think that sometimes God wants to just blow people's minds, boom, and yes. then there's nothing to argue about. They're just stuck that this thing happened that they can't account for it. And if, and if they're in the right place, it yeah. changes everything for them. But I do agree that arguing, to my mind, it's useless because you, you can't argue somebody into faith. Yeah. I even think you could practically prove things and it makes no difference to people. It's as if there's a wall. And so ultimately, and this is what makes it so difficult, you're talking about a mystery. You're yeah. talking about, it's a spiritual reality that uh, it's not as if logic doesn't come into it. It's not illogical, but it's extra logical. Yes. It's beyond logic. So logic can come into it. We can have logical conversations. I do think that there are people that want 
to know, part, part of what they're looking for is an excuse to say, okay, so is, it's okay for me to believe that? It no. is logical, yeah. it is scientific, it is I don't have to become an idiot. You know, if once people feel that, then they may say, okay, I'll, I'll go further or I'll sure. listen to more. For many people, that's not the case. Obviously, in the, in the third world, people have got all kinds of problems, and if you go to pray for somebody, it's not, uh, yeah. you know, but, but that's, uh, that's kind of an extraordinary story. Have you m talked to this purser? You probably have people like this all around the world that you're bumping into. Well, he, he, he was so excited, he gave me a bottle of Dom Perignon <laughs> to say thank you. Mm. So I said, well done, mate. Wow. Yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. But I'll tell you another story. One of our neighbours, okay, they're not, they're not uh, Christians, but they call my wife and I the neighbours from heaven. That's quite nice, isn't it? Because you wouldn't want to be the neighbours from the other side. Right, right, And right. Um, anyway, the lady, the lady had a stroke, and she fell into a coma. And uh, she got transferred from the hospital... Uh, near where we lived uh, to the hospital here in Oxford, John Ratcliffe, and uh, in intensive care. And the family came to see us and they said, um, we've just met with the doctors and she's brain dead. And she's on a life support machine. And uh, after five days, we've agreed we're going to switch it off. So my wife said, well, look, can we visit her before you switch the machine off? And they said, oh, would you, would you? Because she was so fond of you. And that would be such a nice thing to do. And the only day we could go because of our schedule was the fifth day. So we go to John Ratcliffe Hospital. We go into her room in intensive care. She's got tubes all over her. And I said, oh, it's the neighbours from heaven. And my wife goes, don't be so loud. You know, we're in intensive care. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Anyway, so I start speaking to her, and I say to her, we're going to pray now. So I, I held her hand. I held my wife's hand. Killy held her other hand. I said, let's pray the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that Jesus encouraged his followers to pray. So we prayed, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And as we said, your kingdom come. She woke up. She's home. Okay. We live, we live in a That's, world no. of miracle and mystery. But I mean, that is a miracle. Yeah. That is a yeah. What in the world did the doctors say? Well, that's the, that's the mystery. When these things happen, they, they, uh, people can't quite uh, understand it. And, you know, what, what do you say? She's brain dead. They're going to switch the machine off. We say a prayer. We don't even finish the prayer. <laughs> halfway. You're a, bit, you're a bit disappointed, aren't you? Well, halfway. You wanted to at least finish she it. She wakes up. She's home. No, but listen, we have prayed for other people, and, and they haven't been healed. Of course. Yeah. We live in this world of miracle and mystery. If you and I, Eric, could fully fathom and understand God, he would be the same as our little minds. Therefore, he wouldn't be worth believing in. Wow, I've never heard that before. I've heard almost everything. Yeah. I've never heard that before. No. I mean, I've heard a similar yeah. concept, but that's a beautiful way of putting it. So it's only as we come humbly to God can we begin yeah. to fathom and understand. What do you think has happened here, especially uh, in, in England and Great Britain, that people are more and more secular and, and more and more hostile to open expressions of Christian faith. I mean, we're seeing this in the States as well, but it seems to have been happening here at a slightly accelerated pace. What's your take on how that can be happening? I know people say that, but I don't, I don't believe that. Um, I think uh, people are very receptive, okay? I, you know, I've been doing what I've been doing for 33 years. Um, I think people are very spiritual, but it's pick and mix. So it's a little bit of this, it's a little bit of that, a little bit of this. Mm. My, my hairdresser, I went to get my hair done, and uh, I, know, I know I don't have much, but you still need a bit done. And, um, you know, she had a rabbit's foot on her key ring, so it's sitting in front of me. So I said to her, why have you got a rabbit's foot on your key ring? 
Ah, she says, that's to bring me good luck. I said, but the rabbit wasn't lucky. <laughs> so if the rabbit wasn't lucky, why would it bring you any luck? And she goes, I never thought of that. <laughs> I never... And she took the rabbit's foot off in front of me and threw it in the bin. But can you see... I think there's a lot of people who hold on to things yeah. thinking that they're going to, you know, bring them luck. Or sometimes I'll pick up a, a taxi and uh, the, the driver will have a horseshoe. And I say, oh, why do you have a horseshoe hanging on your mirror? Oh, it's to bring me luck. Well, how's it going to bring you luck? And then I might explain to them a little bit what it actually represents. Go, really? Well, actually, what does a horseshoe represent? Well, nothing. That's the whole point. Oh, but I thought it was going to be something interesting. No. All right. You know, and it's... Right. Uh, so <laughs> I think what... We, there's so many things that people are clinging on to that are not the real thing. They're facades. Mm. They're illusions. Mm. You know, and I, I really do believe that Jesus Christ, the founder of Christianity, um, is alive today you see I, for me that's the thing you know if you're walking down a street you get to the end of the street and it branches into two and you don't know which way to go left or right i don't know there are two men lying there one's dead one's alive which one would you ask for directions <laughs> is, so that a, is that a trick question no i think i know the answer because people don't tell me Okay. They'll often say about other philosophers and other faiths and other things. Well, the reason I talk to Jesus is because I ha it's not because I've convinced myself he's alive. I actually do know he's alive. Mm. Well, I'm uh, afraid I would agree with you. It's but it is a funny thing, trying to communicate that to people who don't know that. It really is, and it's an extraordinary thing, because sometimes it works. And other times, people, it's as if you're speaking a foreign language. Yes. People don't have categories. They, say, they probably have to say, well, you're crazy. I, I had an experience, yeah. actually, with a friend, actually here in England, a number of years ago, maybe seven years ago. I was in, uh, I was, <laughs> I was in Dallas, and I, by mistake, I have about 2,000 numbers. on. Back then, it was a BlackBerry, so it was probably more than seven years ago. And I, don't ask me how, but as I'm packing to fly directly from Dallas to London to go to Newcastle on Tyne. Is there another Newcastle? Yeah. No. Uh, Again, there is Newcastle. one other, but so, anyway. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I pressed it by mistake. Something, I don't know what, as I was packing, yeah. and I realized I, I just dialed one of the 2,000 numbers on this thing, and it's going in to talk to, to this person. And I, and I recognize it as the name of someone that I really don't know very well at all. Yeah. But I had the number in it. I thought it would be so embarrassing if the call goes through and I have to pick up the phone and say, oh, I'm sorry, I just, you know, misdialed, and, and how are you, by the way? You know, we haven't spoken in 10 years, and, and, you know, this awkward thing. So I shut it off immediately, and I just looked at the name, and I thought, what a bizarre... It's just such a bizarre thing yes. to suddenly be, you know, speaking to somebody. Whatever. Anyway, so I fly from Dallas straight to uh, London, then go to Newcastle, whatever, and I'm at this conference, and it's a particular conference, I won't go into it, but it, it was a conference. I really didn't want to be there. I didn't know a soul there. Uh, or actually, I knew the one person who'd invited me, and I got there late, so I said, instead of barging into the session, I'll just wait till they're finished, and I'll wait here, and I'll kind of flip through the book uh, that tells me who's here. You can read all their biographies and stuff. So I'm flipping through, flipping through, flipping through, and it's all business people and things that I, I just don't know anybody, don't know me. I finally get to the W's, and of the 250 people, here's the name of the woman yeah. I mistakenly dialed yeah. in Dallas 12 hours previously. She's in the room. She's here. Yeah. And I said, I don't care who you are. You think that's a coincidence? I know. It's insane. I mean, it's absolutely insane. I said, this is so stunning to me. When you figure out the odds of who could be at the conference, who could be in my black bag, just thousands of numbers. So I go up to this person and I tell her, is the point of the story. I tell her what happened, hopefully in a, in a way that you know wasn't just crazy, but she clearly got it. Yes. Right. But the look on her face was horror rather than joy, because it was like 
so that weird stuff you believe mm. might be true. Yeah. That's scary to me, right? In other words, it was scary. And I realized that you can have that reaction, right? A pure yes. miracle, and the person just says, you know. Or somebody, uh, it's like throwing BBs against a brick wall, where you, you, you say some amazing thing, and, and people go, yeah, the, the brain does funny stuff. Yes. And you think, no, 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 no. I don't think you listen to the story. Yeah. Like, this is yeah. as close to proof as you can that there's something beyond this world. Yeah. And communicating that, ultimately, it's a spiritual thing. Absolutely. Because it can be just checkmate, and people say, well, I don't care. Oh, no. I don't care. Well, on that happy note. Yeah, but I spoke in Sydney University, and um, it was they couldn't find an auditorium big enough for the meet because thousands of students were coming, so we had to have it in the open air, like Whitfield, a bit like that. I mean, thousands. There'd be thousands of students, and um, uh, after the first meeting, I'm I'm speaking to somebody, and this girl comes up, interrupts us and says, I hated what you said. So I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I said. And she said, yes, she says, I think Christianity ruins people's lives. So I said, well, I'm really sorry that you think that. I said, look, have you got a, have you got a few minutes? And she, she's like, why? I said, well, if you've got a few minutes, I'll take you for a coffee. And she's like, I don't know. So I said, well, look, you'll have to make a decision because you know, I'm not gonna wait here all day, but let me know if you wanna go for a coffee or not. Anyway, we go for a coffee. So we go to this coffee shop, we sit down, and I, all I said to her was, why, why are you so angry? And it, it all came out like that, why she's angry. I didn't argue, I didn't say anything. I said, listen, I'm, I'm speaking on Tuesday. Come and hear me Tuesday, I'll take you for coffee. She said, I don't know. She came, we went for coffee. I said, come and hear me Wednesday. Hear me and I'll take you for coffee. She came, we went for coffee. I said, come and hear me Thursday, and I'll take you for coffee. Does, she came. Does your, does your wife know about this? Yeah. <laughs> Took her for, for coffee, right? I said to her, come on Friday, the last meeting, and we'll go for coffee. On Friday, this girl decides that she's going to become a follower of Jesus. Okay, this girl today, her name is Christine Kane. She runs a ministry called A21 to abolish human trafficking. And That's all I did, good. I can tell you this, God. those five talks I gave did absolutely nothing. Yeah. I just listened. Yeah. I tried to help her disentangle things. I just, you know, cleared some of the mess. You see, God can take the mess and make it into a message. And the, what people don't realize is the past is past. You see, it's people's past that becomes a hindrance to the future. Mm -hmm. We can't alter the past, but we can bring the past to the altar of God. And when you bring the past to the altar of God and you have that sense of healing and forgiveness, it totally liberates you mm. for all that God wants you to have for the future. And really, that's the essence of what we're saying, what Christianity is. It's saying walking with God and being who you're meant to be and enjoying it in the process. As I said in my introduction, you have spoken around the world 69 countries, that's extraordinary, uh, six continents. How does that work? How is it that you come to be invited? Who invites you? How did you get to a place in your life where you are doing something that most people would only dream, um, would dream about doing? And have you ever been tempted to preach in Antarctica? Well, I... <laughs> The, 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 if you have a dream and a man yeah. in a dream says, come, come over, would you do yeah. it? <laughs> well, listen, I'm really happy to go anywhere God wants me to go. And really, 
if I look back over my life and the work that we've done in th over 33 years, it's not that we've worked out a strategy, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to conquer this and we're going to do that. I think you, you just kind of want to fix your eyes on Jesus and just allow him to lead you, to open up the doors. To, and and I, I'm chilled. I'm not a driven person. I'm trying to just follow the lead and uh, be chilled about that. I'm never in a hurry. It's interesting, actually. In the garden, God walked. In the Gospels, Jesus walked. There's only one place in the whole Bible where God ever runs, and that's when he ran to a prodigal. So if God walks, why are we running? And it's just keeping in step with the Spirit. Mm. And being chilled about it. And being chilled about it. And enjoying the journey. That must be a British term, chilled. We don't have that in America. Be chilled about it. <laughs> did we thaw get it? out. Did in we... other words, thaw out about it. You know? Thaw out. That's it. Why don't you? So encouraging that I'm almost speechless. Almost. <laughs> Socrates in the city at Oxford with Canon J. John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>